Hello and welcome to a special edition of History Hack. Uh, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hand straight over to my co-host who's going to explain why we're here because he did all of this, didn't you, Marcus? Thank you. Yeah, well, I was saying it, I'm blaming uh, Hugh Ross and Ian McNeese massively because they wanted to reminisce about the Falkland Islands in the middle of a shark podcast, which I thought was OK. <laughs> but Jason Falky obviously wanted to talk about his book. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> so... Uh, we thought it would get this together and so I contacted Stuart and he's helped put together a brilliant cast and crew and we've also got on Professor Tony Pollard who normally I know from Waterloo Uncovered but is actually a Falkland Island basketball archaeology expert so we go around mm. the room we've got islanders we've got marines and we've got uh, historians and the director of one of my favourite war films and I'm already kicking myself for not championing it a couple of weeks ago because it's, it's the British humour in a <laughs> gentlemanly act that comes through that is just brilliant. I think the highlight for me is the guy with the flag. I'm just trying to get to work. Brilliant. Oh, oh, flag Harry in my hand. Harry Jones. Just trying to get to work. Um, Harry so Jones. If we yeah. go around in a bit more detail, we have Stuart Urban, who wrote and directed this film. Hi, Stuart. Hello. So excited to talk to you about this. And Marcus mentioned we do have, we generally find when we do these actor catch-ups that it's best to have a grown-up in the room because Marcus and I don't qualify at all. So we do have Professor Tony Pollard with us from Glasgow University, who's a conflict archaeologist and a uh, general guru of all things warlike. Uh, so if we have any questions about the actual fight. I have to, I have to say, Alex, I'm, I'm also, like Marcus, I'm a huge fan of the movie. Um, I, I think it is. I'm, I'm a big movie buff and I'm, I'm a bit starstruck to be sat here with these guys. Um, and I, I think as far as war movies go, this is a very important film on a number of, of for a number of reasons, which we can maybe discuss. Briefly. Yeah. And when we get into sort of the, the story of filming it as well, I think possibly a really unique experience as an actor as well. So we do have a number of the cast with us. We have military cast with us. We have, oh, he's back, the wonderful Hugh Ross, Major Gary Newt. Hello, Hugh. Hello. Still in Brighton? Yes, still in Brighton. Still bored? No, not, well, fairly bored from time to time. Yes. We'll get there, we'll get there. We will have our drink up in the end. Yeah, we we have with us Matthew Ashford, who played Marine Farnworth. Hello, Matthew. Hello there. We also have with us a representative of Government House, which was uh, looked like a very nice bungalow. We have Ian McNeese with us. He's back. He played Dick Baker. Hello, Ian. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. I think you qualify for one of my favourite moments in the film when you're lying under that table after about, and it's daylight by then, and you, the look on your face just says, bugger this. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was absolutely <laughs> <laughs> I think it was m m many more more ways than one. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. We will find. All how many how many more takes do you want, Stuart? For Christ's sake. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a number of the Islanders in inverted commas with us. Uh, we have Trevor Cooper, everyone's favourite Falkland landlord, uh, who played Des King. Hello there. We also have Flip Webster, who was Mrs King. Hello. Yes, I didn't have a. The real Thanks. one was, was Ning. She was Nanette King, wasn't she? Was she? Maybe I didn't have it now. I'm just going to check. Uh, the credits doesn't say, does it? do they? Uh... Nanette, wow. <laughs> we uh, also <laughs> have with us Chief of Falklands Police, Alex Norton, who was Ronnie Lamb. Hello, Alex. Hi, yeah. Hi. Uh, a, a brilliant. Uh, we, we will talk about the British humour in this. There's a brilliant line with the guy with the flag walking along and someone says to you, you're Scottish, you go and get him. As if he's your responsibility, which is fantastic. Uh, so send in the jokes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm a little bit starstruck because we also have with us Mike Grady. And my entire lockdown life, Mike, uh, consists of writing about dead people and doing war history with UK Gold on in the background. And I think I must have sat through about all 9,000 episodes you ever made of Last of the Summer Wine. Yeah, that was just the first series, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just, I was like pretty sure I'm getting to the point where I'm like, I must be a point where I've seen them all and they just keep coming. So, no, um, they, they, they breed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, of course, were Barry in Last of the Summer Wine, but you were in... Uh, and I'm gentleman the act as well, playing Patrick Watts, the DJ. Yeah, Patrick Watts was the guy who ran the local radio station. A very brave man, actually. I, I think I probably did him a disservice, but, you know, it was a long time ago, and maybe he's forgiven me. No, I like your little stand at the end. Like, I will not put it down while you're pointing a gun at my head. I thought it was brilliant. It was very British. It was like, what you said. Me, but this is where I draw the line. Well, it's what, it's what he said. Yeah. I went to Falkland's house and got the tapes. 
Yeah, I, I got a load of I got a load of tapes from Portland's house yeah. before we did the shoot because okay. I wanted to know what it was like on the island. I was going to say that, that, that bit Stuart must have got for you. Or you've got them because it must have been like line for line because it was being pretty much. Broadcast. Well, Stuart, I, I, mean, I tell you, I didn't do much writing. <laughs> Most of it was verbatim, you know, just a cut and paste job, really. Uh, <laughs> a, lot of this, a lot of this was act as as spoken, you know. As but the, that's, um, that's the important thing about the film. It's so accurate. It's unbelievable. And I met Patrick Watts, who unfortunately oh, yeah. is no longer with us. Yes, I uh, read. And uh, he's he was an amazing character. I thought Mike's portrayal actually was was spot on. Um, that that kind of laconic humor, and you can you can hear those tapes now. They're on they're on YouTube. Um, yes. And it's a stunning piece of history captured that take yes. that take that gun from away from my back sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. There was the, a um, outlook or hist uh, or was it the history? Uh, the World Service History Program had some of those extracts on again. The uh, the people at Falkland's house were tripping over themselves to be helpful. They were amazing, and uh, they gave me a pile of leaflets and the usual stuff. But they said, they had all these tapes of of shows that he'd done because he rec he re recorded every day, and most of the conversations he'd have were about sheep. That was <laughs> endless, endless stuff about sheep. So where do you get your sheep from? Oh, I get them from New Zealand, oh, really? And how do they come over? They come over in a ship, and how? Do, and it went on, and I thought, this is how they live. And then they would have the news item on the tapes, which was the uh, a five-minute piece about the police pulling up outside a school and making a report because there was a cracked, uh, a cracked drain pipe. And this would take five minutes minutes of news time on the local station i mean they just filled it with as much stuff as they could get so the invasion must have been huge like a godsend absolutely <laughs> Big news she day, were involved yeah i don't know if it's um <clears throat> if it was done for the film or that was the actual playlist from the night that oh, it, all of those were, were played all it's of those brilliant uh, just again with the british humor of some of the songs that got played over like yesterday james last <laughs> Climbing Strangers in. in the night as the as the yes. last minutes land. I mean. uh, we also have with us Ian Embleton, who was Marine Georgie. Hello, Ian. Oh, hello. hello, hello, Ian. Hello, Hi, Ian. It just seems like this must be so rare. This opportunity to, as an actor, where you get thrown into the exact place it happened with the people it happened to one decade later and have to act out what happened must have been bizarre. But Stuart, where did you get the idea from and why did it come about? Was it an anniversary effort? Well, what happened was I had originally been involved with a, 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 what was going to be a feature film, my feature film debut, uh, a completely different story uh, about Three Para and uh, people I'd known from Three Para and telling their story. Um, it was called Don't Cry For Me. And, and end up the company I was going to make it for, the day I delivered the first draft, went bankrupt. Was, this was Canon that owned half the British cinemas at that time. I remember them. And they said, no, no, we're going to carry on making your film. I said, but how can you? Can I buy the script back? In the end, I couldn't get it back. It would end up in litigation. Which, uh, So I was trying to look for another idea. I did get the script back, but by that time, um, I thought, well, I'd come across what had happened at, at uh, Government House. And I was saying to the Canon at the time, look, you can't afford to make this big film, which would have been a multi-million dollar. Um, what, what about making this this, you know, more compact story? And they said, no, no, we only want to make your other script. So I'd started scribbling something and then the 10th anniversary was looming. Um, the BBC officially turned it down, as is the way of many of these things. Uh, the head of drama turned it down. But I went through a side route with an independent company that had a direct line to Alan Yentog, who was controller of BBC Two at that time, who effectively went round the side of the head of drama. And that's how it got made. But you said, um, you briefly just mentioned that you didn't have to do very much writing because and this is essentially verging on a drama documentary, isn't it? Well, yes. I mean, uh, you know, there were obviously some liberties, but uh, but uh, you remember I, my sources here were either what was published, the radio tapes, um, and also a lot of, uh, it was all primary sources. And since I interviewed a lot of these people, the real... Uh, Mr. Baker, you know, so Ian was playing stuff, which he had told me. I interviewed uh, Rex Hunt. Um, I interviewed pretty well. Uh, and, I, and I went to Argentina and met the actual spy, Gilbert and Commandante Busser, 
and uh, a lot of these people I met, you see. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, I wasn't just inventing things. And therefore, um, it was pretty solidly based on, 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 on testimony. And at times that there were contradictions, like Rex Hunt said, yes, I definitely sent the FIDF up onto the ridge to prepare to <laughs> defend that government house. And thank God they didn't go because... You know, they said he never told. I, I spoke to members of the FIDF, who of course appeared in the film as well, um, the Falkland Island Defence Force, who, who were, I think, you know, we accurately portrayed some of their weapons, the old Lewis gun and thing. Um, and they said no, he never told us to go there. Had they been there, they would have been shot to pieces. But you know, thank God they weren't there. But I mean, that's that, that kind of stuff. Obviously, as a writer, you have to work out well, okay, what really happened. You have to take a view. But other than that, you know, as, as you all know, as historians, you have to impose your interpretation of contradictory facts. Uh, other, other than that, <coughs> it was pretty well me just, yeah, spooling, you know, shaping what these people had told me. I'd love to know what some of the actors made of being cast in this. I mean, it, it was only 10 years before that the Falklands conflict had happened. Well, well I was, I was tremendously excited as a young early 20s guy um i grew up dressing up as a soldier so to get paid to dress up as a soldier and go on a real adventure like that i mean i couldn't believe it um and then stuart made sure that we all we were sent to uh some of us were sent to the brecon beacons to train for uh, how uh, long how we, we trained we trained i think it was about a week or so we were there um, and it was um, a real eye-opener, and I remember it vividly, um, because when we got there, the two guys that were kind of running the camp, they had a kind of attitude of, right, okay, we got some actors, this is going to be a laugh. This is going to be a lot of fun, <laughs> breaking these lot. But what Stuart had done quite cleverly, when I look back, he'd cast people like Ian, okay, I think I was the youngest there, in fact I was, and people like Chris Walker and Ian really stepped up, and what Stuart had done, I don't know if you did this on purpose, Stuart, but we all were, and I'm sure Ian will back me up here, we were all very into our sport, football, rugby, and we were all into that in, in an amateur level. But we were all extremely competitive guys in that group. And they tried to break us, and they actually didn't. And uh, Chris Walker kind of became the leader. Would you? Would, is that a, a fair enough memory, Ian? Uh, all, yeah. all I remember about it was that you know, obviously, I was looking for people who who, who fit the part and who I believed would be, you know, gung ho. Uh, and um, some people, uh, obviously, in the Falklands, you have actual military experience. But but um, the, what I did say, I remember to the trainer was, you know, make them not make them fight each other, but yeah. You know, push them, you know, in the sense of like, you know, goad them if you can within safety margins, you know, as, as to really push themselves. That That's all I remember saying, with, you know. Well, it certainly wouldn't be allowed now, the things we did. <laughs> there, there, there's no way in this culture we would be allowed to do, they wouldn't have got the insurance or anything. Cause really? We were, we were abseiling, we were being thrown around. I remember once being woken up in the middle of the night and we were sent out on a night march. And um, they booby trapped. They set up some booby traps, <laughs> and uh, they had they had trained us. They had trained us how to find a booby trap and what to do if you found one. And we found this trip wire, and we were feeling very pleased with ourselves. Uh, that was like in the middle of the night, and there was a trip wire. We thought, okay, we found it, and each each guy had to go over it. And there was a certain way you did it. I won't bore you with it all the details, but the last guy, the last guy was going over it. And his, and his training leg just caught the wire. And once you'd got over the wire, you had to go forward about 10 metres and get into the ditch. And there was a very bright moonlight, I remember. And he just started running towards the ditch. And we're thinking, why is he running? And you could hear this clanking sound. And it was the, <laughs> it was the, it was the stun grenade on a wire about four <laughs> feet behind him. He was trying to outrun it, but it was round his ankle. And then no. suddenly this... <laughs> Yeah, and this stun grenade went off just as he hit the ditch. And oh, blind, it was live. Yeah, it was a proper stun grenade. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, it was live. Yeah, and it was. Um, I remember thinking, wow. Well, a, a few. I remember us still talking about it later. Why are they called stun grenades? Because you'd imagine that everyone would shout out when a massive explosion happens. 
in the dead of night and a big white flashlight that blinds you for three or four seconds. You think everyone would scream, but it was just total silence because it literally does stun your senses. And for three or four seconds, there was nothing said. Absolute silence. And then the silence was broken with some little lone voice going, fuck me. But I, I remember I remember that vividly. And they put us on assault courses. And I remember we were doing a, a, a long march and we were with all this gear on and everything. And um, one of the lads was like, oh, fuck this. I don't need to be doing this. I'm going to call my agent. This is ridiculous. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> <laughs> like and that series, yeah. They shall remain nameless. Um, and, um, I was going to ask, Chris- because act- actor boot camps, I think the Band of Brothers one was particularly hated yeah. by the actors. We, we had Mark Warren on for Shark, and he said if he'd have had to do the boot camps, the Band of Brothers, he would have buggered off as well. One guy, ref- I won't name names, but one one of the team refused to even go. Uh, yes. And, and <laughs> told Stuart, I was in the room when he told Stuart and just went, don't be stupid, I'm an actor, I'll act, something like that. <laughs> and uh, I remember thinking that I was, because I was so young, I was like, wow, you can't talk to a director like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Maybe because I was pretty young. <laughs> he thought, okay, I'm going to tell him what for. Yeah, yeah. I was only 32, I think. Or something. One of the things I was wondering, uh, directly for um, Matthew and, and Ian, I guess, is um, the weapons. Like, you were are, you are shooting a lot of rounds as a film, yeah. but a lot of the action. And I, I mean, I'm a reservist, and I know that if your weapon handling's not good, you, especially as an actor, you're going to have a really bad time spending half your time with the screen rolling, looking after your, looking after your kit. So you must have had quite a bit of time Doing that. We did. I'll tell you what, I remember, I remember this vividly, okay? So I, was, I always thought I was a, an amateur soldier in my head anyway, in my imagination. So I'd watched loads of war films and whatever. And my father was a police officer in the Met, and so he was kind of into attention to detail. And when we got to this training, these guys said to us, look, guys, we've watched, so, we've watched our Royal Marines and Paras portrayed on film and television all our lives, and it's always so inaccurate. Can someone please, can you guys as actors, can you please for once portray us, like do it properly? And we're like, yeah, go on then. So this is like people like Chris Walker going, right, okay, like what? So even things like how you wear your beret, right? You never fire more than two rounds. You never break cover and fire six rounds. It's two rounds and you're gone again, right? You, you know, wear the uniform properly, please. Respect it. Um, Firefights, they don't ever show firefights how they really are on TV. And I think what Stuart did, having the foresight to get these guys involved, who took so much pride in their regiments, etc., and they desperately wanted us to get it right. And we, Stuart had put together a competitive group of guys who absolutely wanted to get it right. Mm -hmm. So we learned to strip down an an SLR. We learned to strip down an SMG. We understood... Uh, how they worked and we understood that no one runs around on top of a hill because there was tumble down do you remember tumble down which was a yeah. Yeah, and you've yeah. got, you got guys you've got Royal Marines running around with a SLR in each hand firing <laughs> off rounds and it's just it doesn't happen like that and that, that comes across I think like I, I watch the firefights and people are I was just I mean I was re-watching it this afternoon and last night and going oh there's an enemy left and everyone fires around left and you go but that's the training that is there. And I think, I mean, I remember being introduced to an ungentlemanly act and it was a friend of mine who's a, a commander in the Royal Navy and we were hung over in his flat and he was like, do you know what? You're going to really enjoy this film. And then after that, I was like, oh, okay. And I think that's, it, it's kind of in the forces is one of the psyches is this is one of the films that gets the little details. Like you say, berets, you can watch quite a few, I don't want to say BBC oh. things. But the berries off the side like a helicopter landing pad, and you start to go. Yeah, it's not right. Is it? Mike, well, Norman, Mike, Norm- Mike Norman. Mike Norman. Yes. Yeah, Mike Norman, who was the uh, commanding officer of the Royal Marines on the Falklands on, with the in the invasion. Um, he would tell us so many stories. It was, he was he was such a fascinating man, and he had such pride in his soldiers and, and in what he did. And he told us about the berries, and ever since then. Whenever I see a beret on an actor, it's always wrong, 99.9% of the time. And I always think of Mike Norman and the pride those guys took. So he taught us what to do. He said, you get the beret when it's given to you. You put it in freezing cold water. You put it on your head. You shape it. The badge goes over your left eye and you leave it on until it dries. 
Now, we were told that in, in Wales, in the Brecon Beacons, when we were training, we were like, right, we'll make sure we do that. We promise you we will do that. So I remember getting to Port Stanley and wardrobe gave us the berries and we all had our costume fitting in Port Stanley. And then we said, oh, we need to keep the berries. And the costume were like, no, 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 you can't have the berries. No, 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 we need to. We need to put them in cold water, put them on our head. And they were like, there is no way you're doing that. The costume stays here. <laughs> so I think my memory of it is, Stuart, is that one of the guys, it wasn't me, but one of them came to you and said, listen, we need our berries. You need to sort this out. And we did get our berries and we put them and we walked around Port Stanley all day with our berries on. I think I remember so that. to fit our head. Do you remember that? Yeah. I think I remember that. We were so, well, I was, and I felt that the other guys were, we were so keen to not let down Mike Norman and the guys that trained us in Wales. We wanted to get it right. That's great. I think Ian <laughs> and Alex in particular look absolutely exhausted just at the thought of all the preparation the military guys did. Uh, I didn't know Alex... I got away with not, not going to brief it. With Brec 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 I remember having rigorous training with Mike on the Falklands one day or two days. Oh, yes, he took you off for expert. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rolling around and doing all those things that yeah reminded me of being back at school in the CCF. <laughs> um, yeah, and he, he was very, very thorough. He was very nice and helpful. It was great. Um, yeah. A decent guy, yeah. At, at the other end of the scale completely, Mike, you, as you mentioned, um, did a lot of prep in terms of getting hold of the radio broadcast and things, but you didn't even, you didn't go, did you, to the Falklands? I didn't get to go to the Falklands, no. Uh, I loved the film, though, and I remember the, what, what I liked about the script, anyway, was that it was very anecdotal. Mm. Talk about Harry Jones uh, waving the flag. I've got to get to me work, you know, that. Uh, the other thing that I remembered about it, which I really liked a lot, was, um, uh, and I, I guess it's uh, authenticated, was the, a line of, of British soldiers lined up against a garden wall, waiting for the enemy to come round the corner when the lady of the house brings them out a tray of tea. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 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 Just before, yeah, uh, I read that. The same soldiers who thought they were going to be shot, same, same some of those Marines, but they, that was that lady, you know, uh, who was played by the mother of a fallen, uh, who went to live in the Falklands. Her son had died in action there um, in the Welsh Guards. And uh, she reenacted a moment that, that the other woman did confirm that the lady had offered them tea in the garden. <laughs> The it's lady just like nobody's quite taking it seriously, are they, at that point? No. Uh, uh, as, as several of the Pat Watts moments, you know, in the broadcast say, you know, they, they are kind of surreal exchanges uh, where they, it wasn't quite really apparent, I think, to some people how grave it was, um, or else they were being very bold going out, you know, looking for the task force and things. That lady's name was Charlotte Mosley, the real, the real lady. Yes. This is it, it's one of it's one of the galling points of inaccuracy in your movie. Um, <laughs> it, she offers them tea in the movie when, in actual fact, according to Mike Norman, yeah. it was coffee. it was coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, that that's, that's how British. nitpicky you have to be with this movie to get to get <laughs> under its skin. Yeah. I have to ask Alex. Um, you were taking it seriously when you rugby tackled Harry Jones to the ground. How many? <laughs> well, how many? I can't remember how many takes. I don't think it was that many. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of stuff to get through. So I think it was, at, at the most, it must have been two. Maybe Stuart will remember better than I did. Uh, I, well, it looked very accurate, I, I, very real. I can't, I mean, I don't think you'd have had time to have too many tumbles like that onto no. solid ground. No, but but I, I know uh, Ronnie Lamb, who I was playing, wasn't really, very, he wasn't very happy, was he? No, but we did have to deal with some letters from him. Didn't he try to sue the BBC over it? Uh, I don't think it got to litigation. He just felt it was an unfair portrait. And um, and then I think, you know, it was backed up, though, the portrait by several others, including the character that Adam Godley played, you know, yeah. uh, your, your uh, constable. I mean, we did... I would never... Livermore. Have Anton portrayed... Livermore was the constable. Yeah, Adam yeah, Godley that's thing. right, Anton. Yeah. So I would never have portrayed anyone in that light without, uh, as is my technique, you know, corroborate, standing the story up, basically. Yeah. At least one, if not two, witnesses for anything that we were showing, um, uh, and and uh, you know, and the same goes for, for example, when when Rex Hunt came to a screening theatre in Ealing Studios with 
to view the film, you know, and he was in tears. He was so he was in tears not because he hated it, because he liked it, and he was very moved. And and it was only later that he came out with stuff which I think was to defend Mavis, his wife, um, who again we were very very careful in showing, you know, and were com- considerably toning down the amount of alcohol that had been used <laughs> by Mavis. In Mavis's defence, I, I watched that and I thought, that is exactly what I'd be doing if someone told me the Argentinian Yes, yes, and I, and I, I didn't I'd get the gym doing off. anything wrong, actually, uh, in the film, as a, no. as a character. And, and Ian, what about you? How did you prepare to play one of the government officials? Absolutely n- n- no, no work at all. <laughs> I stand up on the day, love. That's what I do, really, you know. Civil service training. Yeah, do his Absolutely. Civil service Pray yeah. and hope. I do say, although actually what was extraordinary was myself and Bob Peck, and I'm not sure if you can choose your cue, cue as well, but we, we, we were invited up to the White House, which was the sort of um, the prime minister of the time, I think, or whoever yeah. it was. Yeah. And, and, and we had a, I remember we had a glass of sherry and we all had to stand up and salute the Queen as we had the glass of sherry. Yeah. And then the guy who'd invited us up, he got more and more drunk as the <laughs> evening went on and eventually started talking about how they were thinking of how they could give the island back to the Argentinians because of, you know, extraordinary stuff went on. Wow. And, you know, really? after that, that was amazing. Yeah. We had the thing too that Gary, Gary Newt had a, and uh, Mavis had a bit of a uh, free song, didn't they? Yes, that was the allegation, but we never, in, we didn't really imply that at all in the film. You did, I, I was trying to play, you did feed it into me and I was trying to play it. <laughs> yes, you that. were acting like you had, you had the hots for her, I think. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was nothing, that's right, that was our subtext, but it was very, very sub. It was, <laughs> not, <laughs> it, with it. Yeah. it was not in any way made explicit or even in, actually implied, it's just, that's how you... Had a bit of your, yeah, your emotion. Yeah. You know, Rosie, she was such good fun, I thought. I got along really well with her. Lovely lady. Yeah, yeah she was. Yeah. I just, if we could, obviously, we, we said when we started that, unfortunately, a lot of people aren't with us anymore. But I think there's two in particular that we'd be doing the listeners a disservice if we didn't talk about them. And one of them, obviously, is Ian Richardson. He was fantastic. I, some of the one-liners from him, the one about not buggering up his umbrella because of where he bought it, that was brilliant. Yeah. Um, and he just, he just came across as a as the quintessential British government bureaucrat, didn't he? I thought he was fantastic. Particularly as he uh, stepped in at the last moment when Ian Holm had, uh, had backed out. That's oh, right. Really? Yeah. Oh, he, I didn't you, know you that. You got him oh. right before filming, didn't you? Yeah, he, he, he read the script. I mean, Ian had literally a week before she... Something incredible. I think a week before the read-through or something astonishing. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh he, he just said he, he couldn't do it. He said, I'm really sorry. I, 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 I think it was stage fright. He said, I just can't do it. And then the script was couriered to Ian Richardson. And he said, yes, by the next morning. And that saved our bacon, really. God, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. He, even, he even looks quite like Rex Hunt. He had just had it down to a T, I think. Yeah. I mean, he was a different, he was more patrician than, than Rex Hunt in the sense of, you know, Rex had more of the kind of common touch, but but that didn't matter because Ian, you know, just was completely convincing in the way he played the yeah. part. Yeah, I I did know Rex Hunt very slightly, but he lived in Purley, and they lived uh, near my in-laws in really Purley and Surrey. Yeah, and uh, they used to pop round as they drink his things like that. You know, and uh, whenever you say in-laws, I see Thora Heard. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're getting to the point where Rex Hunt was married to Thora Heard. Okay, I'll <laughs> go with that. <laughs> Did they get a spin we'll, do, series? we'll do a summer wine. We'll do a summer wine. A summer wine Zoom one day and open your eyes. Um, yeah, uh, and I thought that um, uh, actually, now you've said Ian Home, I thought that would have been about the right weight. Uh, and very amiable man, Rex. They were very. Uh, pleasant people and you could just see how he would be ideal civil service material uh, as what he was doing and then when he became uh, when he went to the Falklands then I I, I thought that was a big leg up but um, I could see how that would work and when I saw the script I saw the finished film and I saw what he how he adopted the the military bearing with the all the, the gear 
I was um, I was very impressed with that. And I thought, yeah, I could bet he could carry that off, I would imagine. I imagine the stuff would have been slightly bigger on him than it was on Ian. Mm. But it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was lovely stuff. Oh, there's a brilliant line, isn't there, when he's all dressed up in the naval uniform to leave, where someone says to him, what, what cupboard did you find that in? Along the... <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's Major Dowling, uh, the, uh, from the, played by Alan Turner. Uh, is that the moment when he, 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 he where he, did you get it in a circus, I think he asked. Him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then he finds the sword and he goes, ah, Wilkinson. Uh, <laughs> it was a Wilkinson blade. That bit was accurate. I'm not sure about the line about the circus, um, but but that was the essence of the exchange, though. That's but they sure. did they did steal his medals. Uh, that definitely yeah. happened. And I was I was just reading the other day. They they, they did. Well, they, I don't think they were as nice as they put in the film. I think they actually just snatched them off him. When, I think how does the good. how does the film play in in Argentina? Well, they... uh, it's been quite interesting uh, over the years getting feedback. Um, it was actually shown, whether legally or illegally, I think, on some independent TV channel. And um, and it went down very well. And I got lots of nice... Uh, repeat feeds. Sort of communication. Yeah, repeat, <laughs> repeat feeds. Uh, lots of nice communications. Um, and, you know, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't like... Obviously, on YouTube, there were so many pirate, pirated versions of the film, which I, yeah. I always take down. Um, but uh, among them, there were like hundreds of thousands had seen... A Spanish version of the film, and the comments were generally very good. You know, a few sort of die-hard, you know, uh, patriot sort of right-wing uh, uh, fulminating about Britain, of course, as one would expect. But, but in general, um, it was very, uh, very nice that we got some very good yeah. feedback uh, from. Is it, is it true that um, after it won the BAFTA, they won the BAFTA as the best single drama, didn't it? Yes. yes. And, and then wasn't the talk of a cinema release, but somebody in the BBC was. had forgotten to get the rights to the music? Correct. No. Yeah. Go on. It was going to go on some, uh, you know, Fox Searchlight or something. I can't remember who it was. They were going to do an independent cinema release. But yeah. they couldn't, the BBC didn't. It was obviously a very big soundtrack in terms of the time, Beatles and so on. Right. Um, and they just didn't want to or couldn't clear the soundtrack rights. Uh, so that's why it didn't get shown in cinemas. Well, Went shame. to film festivals, but not in cinemas. Stuart, sure, that might be your time to talk about wh wh where the film can go, because it's it's got like this real, it's not even a cult for it, it's quite widely out there. But I was saying to you um, in messages, you know, you, you can't really get DVDs of it anymore. Um, Professor Tony was getting a, a VHS shipped to him before yeah. watching. It's not on wide circulation. So what's the... What's well, the or, or... I'll tell you what happened. There's been a continual attempt. I mean, there was a, a DVD, the DVD that went out, uh, what, 15 years ago or something, uh, was quite successful. Uh, and after that time, uh, which was only, again, from the original... It wasn't from the original Masters. It was from the, you know, the, the Beta SP or whatever, DigiBeta. The, the, in other words, not a very high standard of original, which is why it wasn't very good, technically. Um, after that sold out, uh, you could. There was then an attempt by a British distributor uh, called Eureka, very who was specialised in really good art films and sort of genre films, to release the film about three to four years ago with the help of Forces TV, who were going to invest in it or help, you know, do a, a theatrical premiere for charity, for military, uh, for veterans charity. And um, a BBC quoted, uh, I think, £50,000 at the time, which was about what you pay to clear a Hollywood blockbuster for, for, for a DVD release. So that's why it didn't happen. And now we hope uh, that uh, a Britbox, who uh, have uh, said they would like to show it, um, and uh, there's, now, there's now been months of silence of when they're dealing with the BBC contracts department, which I don't know if it's a bad time, but I mean... They said they wanted <laughs> to do it, and um, fifty thousand pounds for them is cheaper than making a drama, you know. Of course, um, and uh, one hopes that we could. We, my intention would be to go back to the Super Sixteen film original negatives, uh, and and then you could show it in its proper aspect ratio as we had always wanted it to be shown, uh, which is sixteen by nine s current widescreen television, uh, not no, I mean, not not cinemascope, but sixteen by nine. Um, and that is the plan, and to do uh, digital, you know, proper sound, 
surround sound as well, remix the sound. But uh, it depends on probably Britbox getting through the layers of bureaucracy at the BBC. I think that's what it depends on. Of which there are many, unfortunately. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> take a yeah. push of equivalent to the task force in, you know, television affairs. <laughs> Uh, departments, you know, to to get this done. But I hope that with public by public demand, or at least some time, <laughs> and you know, we'll get on there. You know, because uh, they put on our friends in the north, which I directed some hours of. You know, and that that's been very successful for them. I saw that again recently. It was excellent, excellent stuff. Marvelous thing. Thank you. When I I first They're not making much, are they? So you know, they need to. Um... They need to fill time, air time there yeah, with the pandemic. Uh, it's a, it kind of, I think it's a good film for the for for the Britain at this time, you know, because it's it's um, you know it's kind of uplifting. I mean, it's sort of bittersweet, but there's a lot of humour as well as. And certainly uh, with the crown, the crown, you know, bringing forth recently. a story with with Thatcher and all that business, it's, it's, it's timely. It's so timely the, to bring it back. One of the great things about the film is that it, it isn't a one-sided thing. It is a pretty unsentimental film about, about the Brits, isn't yeah. it? Because yeah. they don't necessarily come out of it all the time being, you know, wonderful warriors, do they? they there are some... Uh... There's a wonderful one moment, and we will talk about him in a second, where um, the, the guy has died, the one guy that dies in the garden, yeah. and um, someone says to Bob Peck, you, you shot him, um, you shot a medic or something like that, and Bob Peck's face is just like, yeah, shit. <laughs> that's yeah. not good. It's not my finest hour. Just a little look that he does that's brilliant. I think you're right. It's not sentimental at all. That's yeah. someone else I wanted to, um, before we ask you about filming, someone else I wanted to ask you about, uh, purely for selfish reasons, I mentioned before we came online, that uh, I grew up in the 1990s as a child in love with dinosaurs, and he was my idol. I think the whole of Jurassic Park should have been dedicated to the gamekeeper because he was brilliant. Uh, but Bob Peck... Um, he was fantastic. It must have been so interesting for him because the military advisor was Norman, wasn't it? So he had the guy on set every day. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, Bob, you know, it's a great, well, it's a great man, great actor, but you know, it was, it, it was, it was in some way, I suppose, maybe difficult for him, although he wanted to do, I asked, are you happy for Mike to be there? I said, yes, yes, you know, it's fine. But, uh, but, you know, um, Mike, he was very particular, uh, as I'm sure anyone who worked with him will remember in a good way. But at one point I said to, my, uh, to uh, sorry, Bob was, I mean, and Mike was in his own way, but Bob Peck was also very particular and you couldn't just say, go over there. So at one point I said to him, I said, Bob, can, you know, when this shot happens there, this shooting outside, will you then go over there? He said, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you know. Wow. <laughs> Why? And I went to Mike Norman around the corner. I said, "Mike, when that shot happened, because we were, of course, replica type sets." I said, "Would you have gone to the left and to that window?" He said, "Yeah, I would." He said, "Go tell Bob." And then <laughs> did it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> did it <laughs> I, I wanted Stuart. I wanted to ask about um, about uh, Mike's appearance in it. Um, I, 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 I once had the privilege of meeting Mike in the Falklands. Yes. And I was, I was really starstruck at that. I'm, I'm easily starstruck, but I, you know, when I bump into these people yeah. and he, he does have a cameo in it. Is, is he, the, and I can't quite place because when I met him, he was, he was some, somewhat older. Yeah. The chat with the Lee Enfield rifle on the, on the playing field. Yeah. There's the two, the two old boys uh, with their, sandwiches. their packed lunches um, and yeah. they duck in the shooting. That's, yeah. that's, the Brilliant. big one, I think, was Mike. It's an excellent scene, that. Really but, funny. No, that was that had really happened, you know, and I think uh, most of those anecdotes of the FIDF were from the actual people yeah. who had been there. Stuart, may I ask you something about um, Mike Waring, um, who was a producer on it? Yeah. Um, because he was a producer of Edge of Darkness with me and Bob, who came on first? Was Bob first or was Mike first? Who brought each other on? Mike Waring uh, had championed it um, when uh, when the head of drama uh, didn't want to do it, um, and uh, then who was Mike, the head of drama in those days? Uh, a lovely man who I later worked with, Mark Shivas. Um, oh yes, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who, who was very gracious about it later mm -hmm. and just said, you know, he just rang me up and said, "What do you want to do?" And so, and, but he, but you know what it's like. People have so many ideas thrown at them. But Mike Waring uh, may well, you know, I cannot remember whether he suggested Bob 
Um, we I had, wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if we it had came some really good hand. leading actors come to audition. Um, and, uh, you know, I just literally can't remember at this distance if I think because of the caliber of the other actors who are up there, I think, I think Bob probably did audition, but, uh, I, I, I can't, I can't swear to it, you know. Sure. Sure. Thanks. So what I love most about him is how well he just acted with his face. He did it in Jurassic Park as well. He didn't yeah. necessarily even need to speak. He could do it with his face, just yes. with his look, which was pretty special. Uh, yeah. I have to ask you guys, because I know that this is something you want to reminisce, and this is what actually what the reminiscing was about that got us on to doing this. So you're all excited. You've got this job. You're off to the Falklands, somewhere you'd never usually go on holiday. Mm. You get off the plane. What are your first impressions of the Falklands? Because as people not old enough to remember the conflict, I think both Marcus right. and I are guilty of watching that film and going, what's the point in going to war for this? <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that happened when we got off the plane, the very first thing that happened was we were told where we couldn't go on the island because there were mines all over yeah, the place. Everywhere. That's right. We couldn't go there. We couldn't go to the beaches. We couldn't do this. So we could only stay within a very short space of, 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 of time, yeah. which was around the pub and around the hotel. It was quite extraordinary. Which brings me to the uh, the minefield incident, the mined beach, um, which I think I told Marcus about. We, we had uh, a lot of opposition from the government in making this film, and Ministry of Defence were instructed not to allow any assets to be given <laughs> for this BBC production, loaned or in any way compromised. And so we had an interest of health and safety written and said, look, can we film on beach, whatever it was, where these penguins were? Um, and um, they said, yeah, go ahead. Uh, because, you know, that was a different department. It wasn't actually the Ministry of Defence. But the Ministry of Defence, whoever was involved in mine clearance, was meant to have verified that, that beach had been cleared. And we later found out it hadn't been. Oh. <laughs> oh. You would have had Ian Embleton, you know, oh. and various others blown up probably if <laughs> if we had uh, if we had well we just lucky. I don't. I still to this day that could be. Um, it was is that the weird. beach where Ian moons the argies? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Was, was that actually at York Bay? Yeah, York Bay. Yeah. Well, yeah. when I when I was the last there, which was late two thousand nineteen. Um, the team, I, I, I've, I've watched them move those mines over the years, and the team were working York Bay, and they had these massive, big, yellow 360 uh, excavator machines, all armor-coated, um, clearing away these sand dunes, which, which was pretty much at the back of where the beaches, the beaches that they, they landed on. And if, if you filmed in the same location, <laughs> you must have been pretty close to that. And that, that's among the last clear that... It's been in the news recently that, that, that at last the, the Falkland Islands are clear of mines, which is well, amazing. Well, I, I don't think two, actually two months ago, it took them 40 years to, to clear yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, we didn't film in the... I think the, the scene was uh, set in York Bay. Uh, we filmed uh, much nearer to Stanley, you know, where there was a beach with uh, authentic, you know, with live yeah. penguins. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it, it was one of those accessible by car from Stanley... Yeah. The thing, uh, the thing is that a lot of the beaches were mined. At, yes. at, at, at the peak, the, garrison, the Argentine garrison was around 11,000. And given the coastline um, being so long, they couldn't defend all of it. So they tended to mine the beaches. So yes. a lot of the mines are scattered around the coast. Um, so, yeah, it's highly likely if you were on a beach at some point, it would have had mines on, or, on it or close to it. Yeah, well, certainly they, they, there was a rather shamefaced admittance, admission by somebody that it hadn't been cleared. So... Uh, or confirmed cleared, so we, we'll never know. But um, you know, I was wondering for especially then. We'll come. I think we'll come on to everyone. But for like Ian um, and Matthew as the Marines, it's got to be as close to basically a reenactment, like a, a, a drama, rather than a, a film that you are fighting, filming exactly. You know, as, as near as can be, which isn't normally what happens. You know, if there's a First World War drama being filmed, they'll put it in a back lot to actually be on the beaches of the Falklands when the invasion came. So what was that like? Did you, because it was only 10 years after, so it must've been quite um, big in the, in the public conscience. Um, it was bloody cold. Yeah. Um, especially the, 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 the scene at York Bay where I'm firing the GPMG. Um, <clears throat> Cause I've got to show my, my backside. So I couldn't wear any um, uh, long johns. 
everybody else had them in the, in the little foxhole. So it was it was it was absolutely freezing cold. Um, yeah. It was great from an actor's point of view. I I went to um, I went to Limston first before I went to um, in, in, before we did the training with the SAS just to meet. Um, some of the Marines who had, had, had kind of had partook and they wanted to meet me and we kind of did that. I felt it kind of important because you're playing a real person. So I tried to, you know, try and get as much information as I could regarding the character. Um, it was, just, yeah, it was, it was, it was fantastic. When we, before we arrived in the Falklands, I mean, the, the flight itself, guys, was a bloody long flight. Thank God for the Ascension Island. Yeah. And then, of course, being buzzed, you know, the, the exciting thing was being buzzed as we approached Stanley by, you know, the, um, the RAF either side. Yes. Tornadoes. But we had the same thing. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, was, that was great. But and then um, it was just, it was just, the weather was just phenomenal. It was, you know, all kind of, in one day you could kind of get all the seasons. What, what month did you shoot in? When, when was it? What season? It was shot in uh, eight, March, April. Oh, uh, 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 around the time uh, yeah. the actual scenes depicted. Yeah. Um, Which is winter on coming there. So the, the, the weather is, is degrading fairly quickly then. Yeah. yeah. We went swimming one day, I remember. Yes, it's, Hugh, I do remember. We had one of those, there was a mini heat wave one day. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Five or six of us went to a beach. Yes. And we literally went in the sea. Yeah, only for about twenty seconds because it was <laughs> freezing. But yeah. we did actually swim in the South Atlantic, didn't we, Hugh? We did. uh, yeah. Ian in Embleton, when we shot that scene with the machine gun, were you there when we shot the real tracer? We, uh, talking about feeling you were. Yes, really there. it yes. was phenomenal, wasn't it? It we was amazing. A, we had a night scope. I said, okay, let's just check. There are no, you know, uh, fishing vessels. And then they let rip. You know, it was. <laughs> <laughs> this is the massacre of the penguins. Yeah. Yeah, we that are. was where Tony popped up on Twitter because we were going, "This is really realistic tracer. How did you do it?" And you went, "Oh, we use tracer, of course." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the outgoing. Um, yeah. Ian, did you go? To, I remember a group of us who were playing the soldiers. We went. We had a day off. Um, I don't know if you were one of the guys. We went. We actually went up tumble down. I think that's right. Yes. Yeah. And we found a load of because it's only ten years later. Um, but we found shells. We found Argentine toothbrushes and things. Yeah, we found, we the found all sorts of yeah. the burnt yeah, helicopters. Was, the burnt helicopters. It was, yeah, it was really quite. Um, it was it was quite moving actually. It was it was spooky, very spooky. Yeah, there was a lot of this paraphernalia. Yeah, there was a lot. I'd, yeah. I'd, one of the reasons I'm here is that I, I've been pressing the Falklands government for years. To, I'm, I'm an archaeologist and historian. Um, to do a, uh, a survey of all the remains that are still out there on the battlefields, which which is, I mean, one of the reasons I'm interested in it, it's, it's, you know, it's only 40 years ago and it's 8,000 miles away. So the, the stuff is relatively well preserved. Though since, you know, the time you guys were there, a lot has gone, mm. but there's still a lot there. And uh, we've just had the green light from the Falklands government to start a community engagement project where we'll have archaeologists and museum people and students and, and, right. in, and veterans of the Falklands War um, surveying and recording um, all, of, all that remains before it all disappears. Great. So I'd, I'd, I'd really be fascinated to have a, a, a longer conversation about what you remember from 1992 and what, what actually was there at the time. Well, um, you know, we pushed that panhard, the armoured car was pushed on a vast... A huge steel rod. By I was going to ask where would I, I was going to say? Did you push that pan hard? Because I can't believe yeah. that there was one we, around that was still running. <laughs> we had uh, the motor wasn't, you know, the, but what we did was we pushed it. It only moved in a straight line if you look at the film very carefully. <laughs> yeah, and it's being pushed by the truck behind it with a vast steel metal. Oh. Uh, sort of pole thing, you know, which was all carefully engineered that it would work. Yeah, and not snap, uh, which is. We did have a, a potentially bad accident when we had the amphibious vehicles that were filmed in Britain, uh, where we had the illegal help of Royal Engineers uh, detachment. Uh, and we, we had these BTR, I think BTR 50s or the Soviet uh, equivalent of the Amtraks coming out the water. And one of the hawsers, uh, they broke down and we had to rescue them. And one of the hawsers in pulling that out broke, which wow. again, was a narrowly avoided accident because it flew everywhere like a, you know, a huge metal uh, whirly gig. Um, but that that was how those scenes were done, you know. There, there was no, in the Falcons, no extant um, armoured vehicle, of, you know, moving, uh, able, yeah, able to yeah. move. 
there, the, there are the, the, the Falklands Museum, who's got a, 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 who are going to be a, a partner in this project. They are, uh, they've got a, a, an ambitious plan to open an annex to the museum, which is a lovely museum now down on the harbour, which is the entire history of the islands. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the conflict is obviously part of that. But they, they're building an annex, which they're, they're going to put a lot of hardware in. And I, I believe they've been promised a, a sea harrier. Um, oh. if they can get this thing together. So I'm, I'm helping them to fundraise for that at some point. But uh, oh. I'm sure that panhard, if it's still around, will hopefully end up in there. <laughs> yes. I have to ask uh, Trevor. So I'm, every time I look at Trevor, I'm just thinking of calling the midwife. Um, oh. I really hard not to. And I'm really angry that you didn't end up with the, the nurse. Uh, yeah, well, you know, the, these things happen. I think part of the problem was in the next series, I was doing some theatre, so I wasn't always available. Ah, uh, okay. So I sort of gradually got uh, sort of slightly written out. Uh, can I, you, I think. Can you fix that though? Because I'm really am put out by the fact that they didn't end <laughs> well, up. Well, uh, you know, we tried. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't go down to the Falklands Islands, did you? No. Um, Flip and, uh, and Morag, wasn't it? Uh, and I, w we had a day in, I believe it was Hanwell. Is that right, Stuart? Well, it would have been in Ealing Studios, yeah. I thought, or did we go I, I to a real pub? I thought it wasn't it a real, no, it was we a real pub. pub. Didn't we? And we, we did went to a real pub in Hanwell, which yes, was literally yes. around the corner from where I live. Yes. And which uh, quite that's what it was. And I think, you know, the Upland Goose, I mean, um, all the memories of the Kings were from the actual, you know, uh, Simon Jenkins, the reporter. He really was offered uh, spaghetti bolognese as the, Wow! Mrs. King was most put out that he wouldn't ever. Was ever... Was Des King still running the Upland Goose when you filmed that? No, no. But I mean, he was still legendary. People were frightened to mention his name. It was like, it was like you know, Pol Pot. You know, you didn't. Yes, know, I, I remember you telling me much later that um, he was very put out that he'd been played by a fat bloke. <laughs> 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 well, of course, we did upset a few people, but uh, I always said to them, I mean, the islanders, you know, I, they did, did realise, especially those who were working with us, did, did realise that we were on their side. It was an affectionate portrait, as, it, as of course, we mocked the Foreign Office, you know, and pretty well everyone else in it. I think the Royal Marines weren't mocked, but I mean, <laughs> everyone else in the film was. So, you know, what set the tone for me, I thought the opening credits were brilliant because I sat down, I was like, right, gritty, war film, Falkland Islands, and then a penguin waddled across yeah. shot. Yeah. And then the yes. draggled pony followed. And yes. I just, and the, the sort of like Humpty Dumpty music going with it as yes. well. This is going to be good. Well, you know, the thing about British TV drama is that, uh, you know, it's, it normally is purely the realist tradition and the sort of documentary style tradition. And I was trying to do something whereby, you know, you could show that, history or recent history in such a situation this in this very surreal outpost you could make a surreal film uh with humor and and you know and yet be accurate so that was what i was trying to do you know whereas i suppose other directors writers would have tackled it in a more in a more um serious way with a capital s i mean i, I, I but yes that that i think I, as a military historian, I think the second that you uh, start treating it with too much reverence, um, which soldiers never, ever have, then you're getting away from the actual feeling of the time, aren't you? But I have to ask, Alex, um, did you come face to face with the chap that you played in the Falkland Islands? No, no, he had retired. He had gone by then. He was in Scotland. But, but yeah. But we did film in the actual police station, didn't we? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, and we had... Uh, it was amazing to be there, and unfortunately, a member of our crew, uh, a very aggressive member, ended up as one of the only prisoners in there for, <laughs> after the rap party. Oh my God, I remember that. Yes, there was yeah, a there was a fight in, in the in the rap party, wasn't there? Well, I, yeah. I, I've got to put this off the record, you know, or maybe we just don't mention his name. But the the the, the, the there was this member of the crew, and talking about berets. I mean, he was the one who who, who it was the grip who would say, uh, go up to an actor after the take, one of the Marines. I don't know if any of you guys, any of you three boys, but he would go, can I use the C word? I mean, I, I use it only as he did, and whether you broadcast or you can believe it. He said, you know, you were really good in that take, but you wore your beret like a <laughs> 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 and The poor actor would sort of go away and go, <laughs> ruin me. And, and, and after Rosemary Leach, who was stuck behind the sofa when she was doing one of the takes, you know, pulling a dolly, 
And he goes, and I go, cut. He goes, oh, that was well over the top. Between me and this grit, right, who'd been in the Navy. <laughs> it all erupted at the rap party when he did the naked balloon dance, uh, not bothering to place the balloons very carefully on the stage. <laughs> and the Islanders were sort of shocked. <laughs> and then, you know, I bollocked him afterwards. I said, look, get out of here because you're just pissed. And then he comes up to me and uh, he's going to have a swing. And then the, Don, the guy who played Don Bonner, James Warrior, said, don't speak to our director like that and nutted him. And an enormous <laughs> fight erupted, uh, which is why uh, uh, Steve Phillips ended up in the prison. Is that it was, it was mean the... that you have to add another day to the length of the conflict? <laughs> <laughs> no, but we, I think that the Islanders were quite pleased that you know he he got his comeuppance because he didn't behave right. You know, I love uh, I love that scene at the police station with Alex where the. And, and and again, it's one of those surreal comedy moments that that works really well. I describe I describe the film as local hero meets Zulu, and uh, <laughs> the lady. I must remember that pitching it to Britpop. <laughs> <laughs> the lady leading the sheep down the street, and the police stations in the background, and you hear the sound of somebody being beaten up. Oh yeah. It cuts to the cell, and the, the solitary prisoner is watching a horror movie. Yeah. on VHS in the cell and that's the soundtrack and Alex comes in and says no more horror movies from you and for you and wheels out the television <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 was that was that there was the guy who was in there I mean I know there was there was two two because we had, let me backtrack a bit <clears throat> who was there when we went to look at the yacht that was for tender anybody remember that there was a yeah, yeah, I remember was, that. You remember that there was little notices up all over the place saying uh, yacht uh, best best bids invited, and just for something to do, and I think a Sunday, we we all went to look at this. A bunch of us went to look at it, and it was a yacht that had been stolen from New Zealand, I think. And it was two guys uh, who had stolen this yacht and got into trouble uh, off the Falkland Islands. I don't think any of them were actually sailors, but they stolen the yacht and sailed got as far as the Falklands and got into trouble in heavy weather. They were rescued by the Coast Guard, and charged with piracy, and jailed, the two of them were jailed. One of them, who was a, a, a one-legged guy, <laughs> one-legged <laughs> guy, had been released early, but his mate was still in the jail. Yeah, that, I've heard that story. They still tell that story. Basically, <laughs> they didn't have enough room in the cell, so they were basically on parole. Yeah, because there's yeah. nowhere for them to go. It was like only one cell. As they were That's concerned. right. And the, and the, guy, the guy who was still there, uh, ran the station when the when the cops were out when they well, were that's busy. Right. That's he right. manned the station. He answered the phones. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it was like Robert, it really yeah. was. It what struck me after the the whole experience was like that was it was really like an an Ealing comedy. Yes, yes. exactly. Ealing, something yes. meets something. Ealing thing. comedy meets the real life. Yes, which it, is why I put Ealing Studios at the end with the uh, yeah. They allowed us to use the clusters um, from Ealing Studios because it was. A, I felt very privileged to be filming at Ealing Studios. So did I. Yeah. Yes, yes, so did I. Yeah. Yeah. How did the Islanders react when you turned up? Were they like, did they immediately want to tell you all the stories they could, or did they just look at you all like you were aliens? Or... Do you know what, Alex? I remember them telling us that they called us Wen Eyes. Oh, that's you know, right. You came, do you remember that, Hugh? Wen Eyes. Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? When, goes, well, when I did this, when I did that, when uh, I went here, when I was I in the there. RSC or whatever, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, right? yes, 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 yes. I didn't know that. Oh. Um, but they my called memory, them my memory of them, my Benny, memory Benny. of them, yeah, we called them Bennies, yeah. Bennies. From yeah. Benny from Crossroads. Bennies. Yes, yes, memory, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Bennies. Yeah. 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 They were Bennies and we were Wenis. And um, yeah. but my memory of them was that they were, my, my personal memory was that they were very welcoming. Um, and of course, a lot of us had to stay in their houses. Yeah, we were billeted. There wasn't enough accommodation. Billeted. You know, we were like, I mean, I was in someone's house in the Same spare here. room. A couple of others, you know. Same here, guest house, I think I was in. But yeah. uh, mm. It's pretty much still the same today. There's, there's the, the hotel. Unfortunately, the Upland Goose has gone west as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh is it? And, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that that wasn't the Upland Goose because I'm quite interested in its interior architecture. So I'll have to go back to the... The drawing board on that one but uh, yeah uh, it's just full of little b&bs and i've stayed in a number of them and they're amazing i mean i i, I love the falkland islanders 
really accommodating and it's it's like staying with your nan or your aunt at times they, they really look after you yeah we, we really had no trouble at all there was something that we were some there was some rumor then spread about portraying it was to do with the was it the scene where they get marched up against the wall that we're making fun of them at that point i said no you know we did, i think their point was marines and fidf people have been put against the wall and we tried to reassure them that it was a, it was a serious scene, although of course it ended sort of with bathos. But I mean, um, no, I, we didn't have any. We didn't have, there was no real trouble at all, actually. Uh, once they, and I don't forget, I'd been there before with the recce trip about a couple of months before, so I'd got to know various people. They're a pretty, they're a pretty um, unique, unique people, aren't they? Because. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're you're born there, and you know you you don't have the normal education route that you'd have. Um, I I don't know where they'd go if you wanted to go to uni. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I I know reading that they said that my character went off at fifteen and went to a settlement school and started teaching, as if leaving school at fifteen was quite normal. And I remember that we had to have um, some some um, dialect. We had a dialect coach too, didn't we? Because the accent was yeah. kind. of a cross between New Zealand and Dorset. Yes. yes. <laughs> Mike Grady's halfway there, but, you know, most of us weren't. <laughs> um, I had to lose my natural Devonian accent, you see, because I wasn't, you know, wasn't quite right. I did love the moment when um, Mike's character's asked about Yorkshire and he just says, oh, I've never been, I just like the football team, so I get the local. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I don't. But... Uh, the other thing was the variety of uh, religions they have on the island. Remember yeah. they had, because Tom Hodgkins had played a Baha'i. I'd never yeah. heard of the Baha'is before. Oh, I've had to look them oh, up. Faith, yeah. And then, uh, he, then he says, I'm a Muslim. <laughs> yes. Or was that the door? Everybody goes, right? Right? <laughs> we went to a very posh party at Government House, didn't we? Or whatever. We did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the world. I remember a woman saying to me, in the very house, and said, "You won't believe this, but um, there are homosexuals on this island." <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I said, "No, no, still." And she, and she said, "Yes, and not just men." <laughs> <laughs> I was also told that I, I was told about the immigrate. There was a very dragon-like lady who uh, was our went stamped. Our, I don't think we stamped the passports because, of course, it's, it is British territory, but. Anyway, there was an immigration procedure, and uh, I was told very soon after, did you meet the dominatrix at the airport? I said, no, <laughs> not that I know of. So oh, yeah, she's a dominatrix, whoever it was. So I'm not sure. I think that was just it, idle gossip. <laughs> it's so, one of those places where there's no secrets, isn't it? There, 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 no um, anybody know an actor called, Scottish actor called Jimmy Yule? Yeah. 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 You know Jimmy? Oh, well, Jimmy. I've known him for 100 years, and Jimmy... Uh, had gone to the Falklands as a student to teach uh, when he was when he was younger, before he really kind of got into acting. <clears throat> and he, when I, I was talking to him after we'd finished it, and he said, "Did you meet Wingnut in the Yellow Submarine?" <laughs> I said, yeah. well, "What?" He says, "There's two hookers. Called, one's called Wingnut because she's got sticky ears." <laughs> and the other one called the yellow, yellow something. Oh, he's brilliant. He's gone, he's gone down and just and everybody at the island. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently they, they still were there. At this point, Mike looks devastated that he wasn't on part of the uh, location. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. I was. Uh, well, the more I hear of it, the more I. I think I would. I probably wouldn't have survived. <laughs> <laughs> So did you really been another shoot another casualty or... of the Falklands War, but, uh, uh, yeah, you always miss out, uh, miss out on those things. I had a few adventures later on, on other jobs, but that one was... <laughs> I would meet people over the years, bump into Alex, do the various... And you get another bit of the story. And, uh, <laughs> right. So this That's is same, great. Same here. There's, a, there's the very rap, much the an element boxing. of what happened on the Falkland Islands stays on the Falkland Islands, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was a the rat right. passage, which really isn't, it really can't be discussed because it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it probably was criminal. So, I mean, you know, I think Matthew yeah. was probably alluding to that the other day in our chat, weren't we? Uh, yeah, that, I mean that, that it was one of the to this day probably the messiest rat party I've ever been part of. 
It was yes. a very messy rap party. Yes. <laughs> you only heard bits of it, which was that it was absolutely. Oh. It was another era, and there was a lot of drink about, and and certainly some of the people from our lot, you know, did not behave very well. Is all I'll say. But yeah. After yeah. Our music, I think we got. We were talking about the opening credits and the sort of the vibe that you get from the film. And I think it, it's kind of summed up. I'll mention again that moment where Ian is lying under the desk with a look on his face that says, this is shit, which is hilariously funny at the time. But actually, lives were really at stake. It's really surreal, isn't it? Um, did that come across when you were filming it? Did you looking at this island and thinking, I just don't know how it ended up, the invasion ended up happening like it did, because it just seems ridiculous like the fact that nobody could speak spanish to talk to the wounded guy lying on the floor yeah yeah that, and that, the that. fact that there's only like four of them behind that rock and they're faking it to try and make it look like there are yeah. more of them and it just it you're right it's like an ealing comedy and there, there are moments when you're filming it where you're thinking oh god this actually happened we're not yeah. taking the piss yeah. yeah yes it was a very surreal you know the one thing uh i say tony will know uh it is a very small place. I mean, uh, it was even smaller, you know, uh, 30 years ago. Obviously, it had 10 years of development since the war. But, I mean, Stanley itself is is, my, is a village, you know, sort of toy town, as, as Ian Embleton's character calls it. And, uh, it, it, you know, when you're there and you find the odd, like in Government House, the bullet holes or the, you know, the cannon, things like that, where Matthew and Bob sheltered behind. I mean, it, it, you were constantly reminded the surreal nature of it. And most so, uh, sad in a way and surreal of all was the little the chicken coop and vegetable patch where where these argentinians were wounded one of them mortally you know it's you stand there and you, i was petting a sheep actually and it was just like <laughs> there's this sweet creature and you know blood was shed in that vegetable patch it's, it's a very humbling sort of weird feeling it, it is in some way surreal and comical but it's certainly tragic as well one of one of those men is now a friend of mine, um, Quiroga. Yes. Um, and he 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 was he was the lieutenant who was uh, who was wounded. Um, yes. Try, trying to trying to help his CO who who kicked in the door and got got a burst. But Diego was was shot three times, um, and uh, he he told me um, over a beer at one point that his life was saved by a Swiss Army knife, um, which was in his webbing. And the round that would have the round out of the three that would have undoubtedly killed him hit the Swiss Army knife and was deflected. So it's so it's the best advert for a Swiss Army knife you could ever. Have. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I, I was saying to you, Tony, I met that guy at a, at a seminar about the Falklands Malvinas in Warwick University. And yeah, amazing thing to have him come out of the audience and say, "Urban," <laughs> you know, that was me. <laughs> yeah, that was I. I had the guy. It's, I, it was just I didn't. You know, you never knew what having three bullets in, in you would have done to a man. Uh, and I didn't know if he was paralyzed or what, you know. So, no, yeah. yeah. But it is brilliant. The amount of fire that's exchanged. And then Bob Peck goes back into the house and says, we haven't got any casualties. God knows how, because obviously no one can shoot straight. Can they in that film? Is that what it was like? Cause they were just exchanging fire and hitting nothing. Well, I'll explain a bit of why. I mean, the soldiers who were firing from the ridge, the Argentinians uh, up on the support uh, hmm. unit, uh, were not aiming to kill people in the house. They were aiming to keep the defenders down, and they were often firing uh, onto the sides or over the top of the house, which would have gone into the water. But plenty of bullets did land up in the house, uh, which some are still, you know, some of the holes are still there. But um, the main, you know, contact shooting was obviously at the vegetable patch. But once those men were shot down in the three in the vegetable patch. Um, then uh d d you know yes a lot of fire was exchanged but um it wasn't like it was relentless and endless uh uh and i suspect that the argentinians were very low on ammunition by the end of it you know before their uh the uh, main force arrived with the amtraks also as well, i remember mike norman telling me something about uh the weaponry so when they knew the invasion was on its way there wasn't enough uh slrs to go round and nobody wanted an SMG uh, because it just didn't have the velocity of an SLR. And with an SLR rifle, you could literally kill somebody through a wall. Um, I remember Mike explaining that to us. I don't know if you remember that, Ian or Hugh. And, um, and yeah. uh, 
that that so no one wanted the machine gun and of course you for, as a, watching films war films you always think oh the machine gun's got to be the best but like literally nobody wanted that everyone wanted an slr because it was a a, a, a big round uh, had a much more uh, longer range and um you could literally um fire if I, I, Stuart, was there not you know we all got um to read reports, marine farm worth report, etc. Did they not think they hit um, someone through a Range Rover outside Government House? Do you remember that? No, I don't. They, 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 they. One of the reports said they saw a soldier, an Argentine soldier, go behind Land Rover, and they just fired their SLR straight through, and they think they made a hit. Um, and I think there was a little bit of controversy over how many casualties the Argentines took, wasn't there? Well, I, I, you know, we're pretty sure there was only one dead, you know. I mean, right. maybe there were more injured. Um, but, you know, the, the, obviously the Marines were reliable in, in giving their uh, as, uh, their uh, account. And um, uh, I think the Argentines, I don't think, were lying. I don't think more than one died. Well, Mike, Mike Norman says in his memoir that there were five, they, they reckon they killed five and wounded between 15 and 18. Um, there's been a more recent. There was there was a book yes. that came out just before Mike's, which um, yes. made made some rather exaggerated claims. I I think um, looking looking at Mike's report, but yeah, the the the, the one official dead uh, casualty on the Argentine side is is the uh, the commanding officer outside the back door of Government House. Gacino, yeah, and uh, uh, Tony, what do you think were the, ac- the casualties? I, I think I, I think that they might be underplayed. Um, I have no reason to doubt Mike's account. There are descriptions, uh, as you've just uh, uh, recounted there, of, of Marines thinking they've, they've downed uh, enemy soldiers. So I, I think that seems realistic. And, and Mike's very careful in his book, he says, which, which he wrote with, with Mike Jones, a, a good historian. And he says, there is, we do ourselves no justice by exaggerating these claims. Um, which is a, a shot across the bow of this other book, and yeah. I, I think he's quite right with that. But I, I, I do think it was in the Argentines' interest to downplay the casualties in that initial engagement because they basically wanted to make out. And this is this is why the film is really important. Uh, what it does is it does justice for that naval party of Royal Marines when they got back home um, after after being being taken by the Argentines, flying out flying out of South America. Um, the, the Daily Mail, um, the, the headline in the newspaper was shamed. Um, Royal Marines in Falkland Islands surrender without firing a shot. And it, it was, it, it, that was a shameful episode of bad journalism. Terrible. It had a lot to do with bad signals and bad communication from HM government as well. And what the film does as early as 1992 is really set the record straight. And I think that's, that's why this isn't just a normal war film. It's a document. And having read now Mike Norman's book, all of those little anecdotes we've talked about, the, the Scotsman going to work, the lady with the cup of coffee or cup of tea, they're all real. And the, but the film got there first. And it's, it's an unusual circumstance where a film gets to the history before the history books do. Yeah. That makes this an almost unique document yeah. in my mind. It is um, very unique as a war film, I think, which is why Marcus and I like yeah. it so much. I, I was reading Mike Norman's account, you know, this week. I got it at Christmas, and I was reading it in preparation for this. Like I say, it, it says, well, maybe we hit five. There were some snipers there that they would confirm and they damn more people. But it was only, I didn't realise it was only published in uh, 2019. It's a really yeah. recent Yeah, book. I must admit, I wasn't even aware of it. It's very good, and it's, it's almost like your movie and the advice he gave was a dry run for the book. Because these same anecdotes appear, but they're yes. you know they're, they're within, like Marcus. You know, here's my copy. Yeah. You know, look at look at my notes on it. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> it's, um... there, was, there was one difference. He, uh, in in Mike's book, he says that the Argentinians they invite Governor Hunt to surrender, and he says the the detachment sergeant major politely declined and asked them to go away, which I don't <laughs> think was the language used in the film. No, no he's very polite, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> it says, yeah. might not have been words that affect, and I think, yes, <laughs> F off, you bastard, might be more accurate in that yeah. situation. I have yeah. to ask then, as it is such a unique document um, of the Falklands War, I just completely at random flip, 
Uh, did you have any memories of the Falklands War? And did it completely like, was what you thought it was from being at home and perhaps seeing the television coverage and then what you knew by the time you'd finished filming it, did it change the way you looked at the Falklands conflict? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I was the mother of a young child, I think, uh, you know, when, when it kind of happened or something. When was it? What year? 82. 82. 82. No, I wasn't a mother. I wasn't a mother at that time. No, I suppose I was... Um, I mean, I just remember that the script was really good and uh, you, you could just see it all. And I think I think it made me think more about the Falklands War then. I mean, most of my memory is about Margaret Thatcher and about how the, yeah. the controversy over whether we should go or not. And I, and I mean, I think maybe at the time I was thinking, well, maybe we shouldn't, you know, um, you know, it's one of those difficult ones. There was a lot of discussion about it. So, but, but it was far away as well. Yeah. I think one thing I can't add up in my head as someone who's not old enough to remember it is if you say the Falklands to me before I watch this film, I think of the huge aircraft carrier and the thousands of people and everybody waving goodbye and all the sort of martial fury around sending a force down there. And then I look at the penguins wandering around and the guy with the flag and I think I can't equate the Falkland Islands in this film with the sending of a massive aircraft carrier down there. It just it doesn't doesn't add up in my head and I wondered if it was the same for you at the time yeah I think it was yeah that kind of confusion lack of understanding you know yeah I think most people probably in this country didn't even know about the Falklands you know didn't even know ours you know what I mean so that's why they couldn't really have an informed view about it probably and uh, I remember at that time just being furious most of the time i mean my sort of hatred of thatcher which has never diminished and what she was doing at that time using the falklands to actually bolster a failing campaign which is yes. what was happening at the time mm -hmm. um and you know my i say my hatred has never diminished and it's only i think trump's the only person to actually overtake her <laughs> a sort of you know but uh, there was it, it, it was such a in one way such a political thing, and then one would see something like tumble down and and you 'd sort of get a completely different sort of uh, feeling about it you know mm -hmm. um, and it was only you know it was only when we did this film really that um, that you realize actually how in some ways there was that weird counterpoint of warfare and village life i mean it i was i was at school in oban in 1982 and uh, i was just about to start the process of applying for sandhurst to become an army officer i was in the army cadets and all of that and all of a sudden uh, and what you've got to i, I tell this to my students say what you you guys you young people you've grown up britain's been at war almost constantly Iraq, Afghanistan, Iraq, wherever. Um, when I was your age, um, Britain was engaged in a war in Ireland, but we didn't see it that way. And to have a proper war with two armies was almost unheard of. You know, you had to go back to, to Malaya or whatever, or to, or to Korea. Well, yeah. this, what was interesting yeah. about the film as well was the fact yeah. that the people in the film, their knowledge of warfare that they're equating this coming Argentinian force with, it's World War II. They're yeah, talking exactly. about Spitfires and what you did in World War II, and you're like, this is not World yeah. War II. And, and then there was a guy in the, in, the, in the year ahead of me at school was in the Scots Guards and he was killed on Tumbledown. Really? You know, and it, 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 it came home in all yes. sorts of ways. Well, uh, I, I did know Robert Lawrence, you know, uh, the subject of Tumbledown, and I've met a lot of his comrades. And, uh, and also, I was, I was, the reason I got interested in the war was also personal level. My brother, uh, if they'd taken the tank regiment, was at that point a reservist uh, in the 4RTR. And if they'd taken the heavy tanks, he would have gone in, and left. BBC, where he's now the, 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 the diplomatic editor of Newsnight, um, and it was really affecting us. You know, it's like, oh my God, he nearly he nearly went. And then I had family in Buenos Aires who who uh, would you know much older, my late uncles and aunts, but um, you know they had children. It was like to me, it was a deeply upsetting um, joke, if you like. The whole thing was like a. a frightening joke and i did have a friend who died there too uh in the welsh guards i'm oh, sorry he'd survived being very badly when he was later killed in the car crash but i mean he was he was very badly disabled after that so 
it affected me on a personal level with some direct contact. What kind of so, lasting effect did you see with the islanders that you met? Were they angry about it or pleased at the outcome and just ambivalent about it? How did they react when you sort of brought it back to them? So you go down there to recreate it again ten years later. Or at the car. Well, I mean, I, 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 it sort of goes back to our point where no, I think they were glad that we were we were we were commemorating it in some way. You know, they had some differences of opinion, like a, as we were talking about, but not not a great deal. And um, you know, there was a, a general support and, and no obstruction or hostility that I remember at all. I don't know if the cast found any different stories, but you know, in general, it was pretty positive. Yeah, in England, the. Um communications between the Falklands and us and via the BBC and various other TV stations was minimal. We didn't have the kind of communication that we have now. We we had a guy who came on from the government every night who was like a... Man, what was his name? Yeah. McDonald. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was and a sort of voice it, like a Dalek. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. And yeah. would report it very clearly what was going on. But that it was always several days after the event. We didn't, I don't think we ever got up to the minute uh, news coverage of, of mm. what was going on. But there's that brilliant the scene where they're smashing up the fax machine, isn't there? Is it a fax machine or a printer? Mm, the telex yeah. machines, yes. Yeah. yeah, that would have been the height of technology. And... Um, Quick anecdote. Sorry, I've got to do another okay. Ian Richards anecdote. <laughs> so uh, we're, the, the, we're smashing up. The, I bring an extra on who's an intern, actually, was a, was, had been at my school. And he gets ready with this huge mallet to smash the telex machine. And Ian Richardson is four grand, you know, ordering the destruction. And the boy, who was only about 18 or something, starts smashing the thing before I say turn over on the camera. So Ian booms, boy! The word action normally denotes the beginning of action. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of like towering and from that moment on wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't yeah. swing his mallet properly, unfortunately. I had to replace him. <laughs> I, I do love because he obviously he was one of the founders of the RSC, which I'm sure he might have mentioned at one stage um to you all. <laughs> did, he, did he did he did he did he by any yeah. time? <laughs> but no, I just love that he just appears to have been as Shakespearean as I always hoped he was. A bit All better. I can Hope say is cool. that that trip to the Seal Island that we did yeah. was spent with him regaling stories of him at the RSC. Yeah, I know. We, we hardly saw a seal, did we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I did a fellow, my dear boy. <laughs> so it's that. I'd, already done, I'd already done something very soon after the talk. It's called Falkland Sound to Plymouth Sound, which was at the Royal Court. Oh, yes. And the, fir- and the first half of it was... Um, Letters from the Falklands, this young uh, uh, officer writing home to his father. It's a very poignant piece, actually. I, th- I think it's called Letter from the Falklands. And I can't even remember the man's name, shamefully. And the second half was a kind of... Uh, they'd done interviews with various people who'd been involved in the war. It's a very... I, I have it somewhere on a VHS. I should look it out and watch it again. But it was a, a very good piece, and we did that very soon after the Falklands. They're actually <laughs> shooting um, a, a film about Goose Green at the moment. I don't know how COVID's impacted on it, but they're they're making Go- the Battle of Goose Green, the movie, in Wales. Oh, are they? Wait, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, remember, I remember wondering why we hadn't shot it in uh, the Outer Hebrides or something, rather than... That's, the, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Yes. Did you yeah. consider it, Stuart? Did you consider it? Might, it would have been a hell of a lot easier, I would imagine. To shoot it in the Outer Hebrides. Well, you know, uh, 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 there was obviously pressure to do it that way, but I mean, nothing can quite. Um, if you've been to the Falcons, yeah, no, quite. it's impossible to reproduce uh, yeah. the feeling. You know, I mean, we did yeah. obviously in studio, you could do, do the interiors, uh, but I mean, that feeling of being there, the light was very different. It wasn't yeah. like, you know, I've been in obviously, uh, you know, bits of Scotland or Wales or that or Dartmoor that you could say might, but they're not really like the Falklands. Uh, I've never been anywhere else that was. So I, I, when I got there, um, we, we actually, believe it or not, when, when it looked like the BBC couldn't make it, we actually flew from Argentina to New Zealand to think, can we shoot it here? With the, uh, the brilliant designer who did it, Steve Hardy, who, who worked out all the trace of fire and stuff. And, and, and you know, we, we could have, we nearly ended up doing it in New Zealand, but there wasn't enough co-production money. So that's why... BBC in the end stood nearly all of it together with the sales agent. Why we went to the Falklands is where I wanted to do it. 
I, we I wouldn't remember. be talking about the same film now if you'd shot it somewhere else. The, no. the place is a character in it. It's, it's cliche, oh. but it's true. Mm. I remember it being very weird. You'd be in your bath and you put on the forces radio and the archers would come on and you'd think, why are the archers? You know, where am I? What are the archers <laughs> doing here? But how easy was it to fly us out there? Because like, the only way you could get to the Falkland Islands was through Bryce Norton. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, how easy... I'll tell you how we got a defence uh, boycott was Governor Fullerton, bless him, you know, which is why he gets a big thank you on the film, sort of said, well, I don't care what the Foreign Office is saying, FCO, uh, I, I'm giving the BBC people the uh, Falkland Islanders rate on the plane. He had the authority to allow us in, and that's why we got in. Wow, wow. wow. Well, that's impressive. Man. Otherwise, the prices of the, as Tony will confirm, the price. Only 3,000 pounds. I remember the people that, that were there as bird watchers who paid like 3,000 pounds to go there. Yeah, in order to have those, those uh, uh, ersatz eggs where you, we could stand the uh, fork on its side and it would still stick in the eggs. And, and the, the, the heating on one of the flights was like Tintin, uh, you know, in the centrifuge where one side was boiling and the other side was frozen. Mm. I remember being. I mean, the planes were incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah, well, they right. were, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember, I've got, got a quick anecdote for you on the flight was that um, we, I don't know if you met, you, obviously there was no drinking for addicts, etc. There was no alcohol allowed and no smoking. Now, back in those days, people would smoke on, on airplanes. So you can imagine some of the crew being told they couldn't drink or smoke for a 17-hour flight or something. It went down like a lead balloon. <laughs> um, and I, you didn't get to check in and choose your seat. You know, you just were, this is your seat. And I ended up sitting next to Hugh. So we introduced ourselves to each other. And when you're sitting on a flight with no alcohol, no smoking and no films to watch or anything, you have to talk to each other. So me and Hugh, we, we talked for many, many hours. And Hugh, do you remember getting caught with your little hip flask? Oh, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't remember that. Did Ooh. I really? you, you had a hit flask of, um, well, you would do. You were, you, were, you were a brilliant, fine Scottish actor. Why would you not have a little hit flask? And um, you got caught taking a little swig. Do you not remember? Wow. No, I don't remember this, no. Yeah, and, um, and uh, you were, t- and, and the, the guy, the military guy was like, you, you've got to put that away. Uh, huh? And uh, otherwise you're going to, and you, we, we, it didn't go down very well. Um, and then when we left the Falkland Islands, um, Again, you didn't get to choose how you checked in or where you sat. And you and I ended up sat next to each other again. And we looked at each other and went, oh, my God, we're going so, <laughs> to... I don't know if you remember, we, so Hugh and I spent 34 hours sitting next to each other. <laughs> I couldn't spend two, for God's sake. Let alone three. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, you spent many a long day with me. <laughs> in, in the Crimea, darling. Yes, yes. <laughs> That was that was well, the only a different plane. podcast, gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, <laughs> that was the only the only flight I've ever been on where I get shouted at. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. When, yeah. when, when I took my feet, there was you no. Know, the, the plane was was more than half empty, I think, as I recall. But it was um, what was it? Uh, uh, was that a 737? Anyway, there was like four seats. It was an old the TriStar. It depended was on the TriStar. Was that a TriStar? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, the TriStar. The, cargo version. the oh. one I went, the freezing one was a cargo version where you were alternately roasted and frozen. Right. <laughs> half an hour roasting, half an hour frozen. That's how the air conditioning worked. <laughs> how, what did you get shouted at for, Alex? Well, because I, thought, well, I, you know, I, was, I went to the seat I was told to go to, sat down in the seat, and um, as just before the plane took off, uh, there was all these seats in the middle, like four seats in a row. And I thought, well, this is going to be a long journey. I'd quite like to lie down and, <laughs> and you know, have four seats. I can just lie down and have a snooze. So I, I called the, the, I don't know what to call her. She wasn't the stewardess, was she? Whatever she was. The guard. Uh, the guard. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I, you know, can I just shift over there? She said, sit in the seat you were given. I said, yeah, but there's a chair. Sit down! <laughs> <laughs> they were very fierce, I remember. Yeah, all right. Zero tolerance. Know, my, my cousin used to do that as a living. She was an RF loadmaster. They used to ferry people to and fro. Oh, really? She, that was maybe things. her then. <laughs> Possibly. They, <laughs> not a very big branch. They've yes. all got the same training, I would imagine. I do remember uh, um, <laughs> Mr. Richardson going up, um, when he got back in the plane a little later, going up to the front of the plane where there were some executives or some sort of people with sort of badges on some very high 
high flown people <laughs> going up and say, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a CBE, but I should be in business class. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, the English English officer yeah, class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Officer yeah. class, yes. Officer class. <laughs> I, ha I have to ask you, possibly just one more question before we go. This has been fantastic. Um, but I have to ask you, you've mentioned Seal Island. How much was there to do in your spare time? <laughs> and what did you get up to? <laughs> karaoke, karaoke in the evenings. Yes, and everywhere was karaoke. That saved us, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. But we did, yeah. we did go on big expeditions. And Matthew, you and, and you know, and and the, you know the. I don't, I don't remember being bored at all. It was an it was an yeah. adventure from start I've to end. Hundreds, of, hundreds of photographs somewhere of it all. Yeah, wow. I, I do as well. Yeah, it yeah. was an adventure from start to beginning. It was. I never felt. I never remember feeling bored. What's no, everyone's party piece for karaoke then? That's what our listeners. I'm, I'm very, I'm embarrassed when I remember this because everybody thought it was very <laughs> amusing, but mine was if I ruled the world. It <laughs> was. <laughs> oh, and we finally get our pub outing, Hugh. You're going to have to. Yeah, do it. I'll have to do it for you. Yeah. Oh, Tom Jones, oh, I Delilah. I'd like to see that again. I'd like to see that again, Hugh Ross. I'd like to see oh. Ian doing Delilah as well. Yeah, that yep. was pretty smart. Yeah. Brilliant. Guys, thank you so much for coming on to talk thank about you for asking. Thank you. All right. It's been lovely to see you again. Thank you very much. It's been lovely to see everybody else. Can I just say on behalf of, behalf of all of us, it was a fantastic experience. Yes. Yes. It was yes. a real, a real life, life changer. It's something you'll exactly. never forget. So thank yes. you, Stuart. Yes, yes. Thank yes. You. absolutely. I second Stuart. that. I second that. Totally, totally, absolutely. A total highlight of... of of what we all did so thank you so much yeah no, and thank you all for for making it as well because uh, marcus and i absolutely love it tony's taken it to a whole other nerding level um by <laughs> being relocated well, thank you for your your academic and professional <laughs> interest it's fantastic you're so interested in it three decades no. on you know. as i said i i genuinely I, I think it's i think it's important historically but it's a brilliant piece of entertainment and it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you all and you should all be very thank proud you, of what Jenny. you've done yeah. we are thank you very much my Only work now, here can, is can, done. When, when, <laughs> when this, when we're through this pandemic, can you organise uh, seriously organise a meet up in a pub? Oh, um, yes. <laughs> I wondered um, if we could possibly recreate it at the Royal Court. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs>